Welcome back to the Gen 3 Iceberg. This is part two. If you haven't seen part one, go watch that first. This will be the final four layers of the iceberg. A couple things before we begin. It turns out that uh, the Houdini set that I mentioned in the last video was actually not an unknown player. That was the famous player Smurf, a pioneer of various hyper-offensive strategies. Not only a proponent of the choice ban Metagross lead in Gen 3, but also the famous weatherless offense teams of Gen 5 or U. And another tidbit about Beat Up that I mentioned in the past video. Not only is it mechanically very bizarre, but Beat Up has another quirk on the cartridge. When you use Beat Up in the game, it will reveal your entire team to the enemy. It will say, you know, Zapdos attacked. Metagross attacked. For each individual beat up attack, it will reveal where your team is. So it used to be optimal in Gen 3 OU to actually nickname your entire team to disguise what Pokemon they were if you were running beat up. But eventually they did remove this feature from beat up on simulators so that players didn't have to nickname their Pokemon for a competitive advantage. And now let's get into layer 5 of the Gen 3 OU Iceberg. The first entry in layer 5 is Cloyster BL. Cloyster is currently an OU ranked Pokemon in Gen 3, but many players believe that Cloyster no longer deserves this title in the modern metagame. Cloyster isn't terrible, it has a lot of advantages. It's a cool alternative spiker with a typing water ice that allows it to actually switch in safely against Swampert, which Skarmory and Foratress can't do as well. It's a bit faster than Foratress and it can outrun and threaten Tyranitar with Stab Surf. It also has access to not only spikes, but Rapid Spin and Explosion, which is a great move pool. Stab Ice Beam is also quite useful. You can do considerable damage to incoming Celebi or even be a backup check to Salamence. Despite all these advantages though, Cloyster's usage and success in tournaments have really been going down over time. Cloyster really suffers from its sand and spike vulnerability. The main selling point of using Cloyster is that it's effective against Swampert, but even then, Offensive Swamp at Hydro Pump deals considerable damage to Cloyster. They can also focus punch as you spike. And compared to Skarmory and Foratress, the defensive value provided to a team by Cloyster is pretty limited. Skarmory and Foratress can both hold their own pretty well against water types, actually, especially specially defensive invested Skarmory can toxic against Swampert, which is a common way to punish Swampert. It's pretty hard to justify using Cloyster over Skarmory. Even on a more aggressive team, Skarmory just has so much more advantages. There are the occasional teams where Cloyster's positive matchup against water types, not only Swampert, but also Suicune and Melodic, do come in handy more than a Skarmory would. It can also dodge Magneton traps, since it's not Steel type, that's an advantage it has. But the situations where you will want to use Cloyster on a team are pretty specific and niche. So Cloyster's role is more of a fringe niche pick rather than a metagame staple. Therefore, people believe OU is a bit too high for Cloyster to be ranked and BL would be more appropriate. And there's nothing wrong with being a BL ranked Pokemon. Many BL ranked Pokemon see play in high level from time to time, but they tend to be more niche and fringe, which Cloyster is at the moment. It's not at the forefront of the metagame like maybe it was a few years ago. I love Cloyster, but I would agree with the sentiment that it has kind of fallen off. Up next, Claydol Renaissance. Claydol is probably the single Pokemon that has had the most significant rise in usage and popularity in Gen 3 OU in recent years. It's always been OU ranked, but I think a few years ago, it wasn't viewed as this powerful top tier defensive Pokemon or rapid spinner. It was viable, mostly used on stall teams, from what I remember. But sometime around 2020 or 2021, the public opinion around Claydol shifted massively when top players like ABR and Altina were not only using Claydol constantly in their high level games and having a huge amount of success, but always talking about how fantastic Claydol is, how underrated it is. Around this time, the most popular archetype in the game shifted from, you know, Big 5 TSS to Claydol TSS, which commonly consisted of Skarmory, Metagross, Claydol, Salamence, and Blissey. These teams would forego Swampert and instead run the combination of Metagross and Claydol to cover the Rock-type matchups. They also started dropping Gengar in favor of Claydol. Because the game plan of spin blocking can be inconsistent sometimes, but Claydol provides you with a very reliable rapid spinner and insurance in the Hazard War. The Claydol hype was at its peak around that time and it's kind of dipped down a bit. The metagame is adapted. One of the biggest adaptations to Claydol has been the rise of offensively oriented Celebi sets. Like the Leech Seed 3 attack set that was popularized by, I would say, Vapakuno and Fredazi. 
who are two excellent players. But I think it's definitely true that Claydol has become a defensive staple of the tier, and most would rank it at least as top 10 in the tier, maybe even higher, which is a pretty huge shift in how it was perceived before. It is a fundamentally excellent Pokemon with both Rapid Spin and Explosion, Sand Immunity, great defensive typing, the ability to soft check many threats and just provide so much defensive value, utility, and even offense sometimes thanks to Explosion and fast adamant boosted earthquakes. Not to mention, of course, Levitate, which is one of the best abilities in Gen 3. The Claydol Renaissance is one of the most significant developments in the modern metagame, for sure. Up next, we have a weird one, Skarmory equals spin blocker. But folks, how could Skarmory be a spin blocker? It doesn't block rapid spin like a ghost type. This is a more abstract idea. The reason that some players say that Skarmory almost feels like a spin blocker sometimes is because Skarmory actually has very positive matchups against some of the most popular rapid spinners there are, and in many interactions can not only dissuade them from clicking rapid spin, but maintain the spike advantage. One common thing that will happen is against offensive Stami, you will make a spike, they'll switch into offensive of Stami, use Thunderbolt against you, and you use Toxic. The Thunderbolt deals about 50 to 60 percent, but the more important thing is that they can't really rapid spin. They're now on a clock, especially if Sand is up, that is denying their leftovers healing. Their limited health on Stami is ticking down. You can protect and chip heal back up, and if instead of using Thunderbolt they just used rapid spin instead, they're in an even worse spot. You Toxic them, and then you can just establish spikes again very easily. At least Stami does have natural cure. It can switch out and heal that toxic, but after they switch out, they're not in a very good position. They've failed to remove your spike. The limited health on Stami has gotten low. They're taking 12.5 from the spike next time they come in. And through Protect Chip Heal, you've probably already gotten back up to 70% at this point or something with your Skarmory. The same goes for Claydol, but Claydol has it even worse. Claydol doesn't even have natural cure, so getting toxic on Claydol is just a death sentence. You can rapid spin if you want, but they can just respike every single time you slowly die while they chip heal or just sit there not worried about anything. The two most common rapid spinner sets are bad against the most common spiker and often Skarmory's presence on the field blocks rapid spin in a way because if they rapid spin they're gonna lose long term so they usually don't. So in an abstract way Skarmory kind of is a spin blocker at least in these particular interactions. There are different spinners or different sets on these spinners that can function well against Skarmory. One is Foratress. Foratress is immune to toxic and can rapid spin in Skarmory's face repeatedly. Defensive Stami sets can also Thunder Wave Skarmory which cripples them for the remainder of the game so it's not advantageous for them to stay in that position and from there they can often find a rapid spin. Claydol also sometimes runs Refresh specifically to 1v1 Skarmory, and they do win long term with this. Refresh has 32 pp, while Toxic only has 16, so if you keep Toxicking and they keep refreshing, you'll run out first. Same with Rapid Spin. Rapid Spin has 64 pp compared to 32 of Spikes, so Claydol can just sit there, refresh repeatedly, and win. But even then, some Skarmory sets run Drill Peck, and Drill Peck Skarmory can actually 1v1 Claydol long term by chipping it down and re-establishing Spike repeatedly. But the idea of this entry in the iceberg is that sometimes you can block the enemy from Rapid Spinning in a more abstract way. Way. Rather than directly going to a ghost type, you can force these 1v1 situations where them rapid spinning puts them at a disadvantage long term. Up next is Cacturn Bane. This is kind of a crazy little factoid about Gen 3. Cacturn's only ability is Sand Veil, which is an absurdly broken ability in Gen 3. It provides evasion when Sand is up, and as we know, Sand is up in the vast majority of battles. Cacturn was not only a cheesy and annoying Pokemon that would fish for evasion by substituting repeatedly, this was actually a really powerful strategy in high level play and this was dominating not only the high ladder with some incredible ladder peaks happening with Cacturn teams but also in tournaments with some of the best players in the game spamming Sandvale teams. It got to the point where people were even running Cacnea as a second worst Cacturn because that's how powerful Sandvale was. You would run Cacnea, Cacturn and Gligar on one team and the odds were so in your favor because maybe you'd land a hit on the Cacturn, get through it, now there's a Cacnea and a Gligar. You just have so much stacked against you. Now, a lot of people on that video in the comments asked, why didn't they ban Tyranitar instead of Cacturn? Well, because Tyranitar is central to Gen 3 and it has defined the metagame for 20 years. To ban Tyranitar would be crazy. Tyranitar's not overpowered. Sand benefits the metagame by punishing defense. Managing Tyranitar is fine. It's totally balanced. 
There's many ways to check and handle it. So nobody wants Tyranitar banned that plays Gen 3 OU. Everyone likes Tyranitar. To ban Tyranitar so that Sandless Cacturn could be preserved, which is a fringe strategy to begin with, would be a bad decision for the game. It would make the format a worse experience for not much benefit. Some people also asked in the comments of that video, why don't they just mod the game so that Cacturn can have no ability? This would be a never before done, unprecedented action just to preserve a very niche spikes user that you would rarely even see anyway. And modding out a Pokemon's ability raises a huge can of worms. Can we do this with any Pokemon we want? How about Latios? If Latios didn't have Levitate, would it be OU power level? Even though Gen 3 OU does have some mods like Freeze Claws and the Beat Up mod that removes the nickname thing, those are like quality of life mods that don't alter the experience in such a massive way that it's like playing a different game. I would compare these mods to something like the Universal Controller Fix in Super Smash Bros. Melee, which is a mod for Melee that makes it so most controllers will act the same because before that mod existed every controller was different and some gave you a competitive advantage so it was this whole meta game of trying to find a good controller that was obviously unfair so they leveled the playing field with that mod so that's a mod that is not ruining the spirit of melee but if you were to go into melee and like nerf fox's shine or something or nerf marth's grab that would be changing the game beyond a reasonable level same goes with pokemon i think you can't go in and mod like the abilities in the state stats of Pokemon, because then it's not within the spirit of the game anymore. That's how I view it anyway. This is kind of a philosophical subject about when it's okay to mod and when not. That's how I feel about the subject. And the Sandvale ban was the most logical way to go with it. A ban also happened four years ago. I am so surprised at the outrage on that video. Most of you probably didn't even play while Cacturn was legal even once, and you're acting like it's a huge issue. Anyway, just wanted to address that, because that video had a lot of outcry. Up next on Layer 5 is the Return of Regice. Reg Regice is in fact an iceberg themed Pokemon, so of course it is on the Pokemon iceberg. In the early net battle meta, I believe Regice was quite a popular choice. It was ranked in OU for a very, very long time. It is the best of the Reggie trio. In Gen 3, Mono Ice is not the world's worst defensive typing for a specially defensive Pokemon like this. The only special attacking type you're weak to is Fire, so you can operate really well as a switch in to the vast majority of special attacks in Gen 3 OU, like you check Zapdos very effectively effectively Stami, Celebi. Fire types also used to be not that popular. Moltres and Charizard rising up in popularity was a more recent development, so therefore Regice had way more room to breathe. But the perception and the viability and popularity of Regice seemed to fall over time. It seemed hard to justify using Regice over Blissey, especially with Blissey developments like Bolt Beam Toxic Blissey that kind of did Regice's job, but are more consistent. And Regice is one of the few Pokemon that went from OU down to UUBL. However, in recent years, like pretty recent years, last two or so years, Regice has been rising up in popularity again. People are returning to Regice and realizing that its unique merits as a more offensively oriented special wall do have legitimate value over options like Blissey and Snorlax. Regice was very popular in Kalos Invitational 6 and had a very high win rate. Even though Regice does suffer from the increased presence of Moltres and Charizard in the modern meta game, it's not too hard to patch up those matchups with something like a Suicune or a Stami, which work quite well alongside Regice anyway. Regice has been popular on special offense teams because it's kind of a special attacker in itself. It's an alternative way to lure in and eliminate Blissey too, thanks to its access to Explosion. It can sometimes be difficult to fit special walls like Blissey or Snorlax on special offense. They don't really fit on the archetype. Celebi tends to be the go-to like Zapdos switch in, but Celebi's ice weakness can leave it vulnerable to offensive Stami sets or offensive Suicune sets. Red Jice fits on special offense better and fits with the pace patches up bad matchups very well. Regice can also be great on a more aggressive, hyper-offensive leaning TSS teams with something like Smeagle. It can be nice to have something that can switch in defensively on, you know, Zapdos or Stami while also keeping pressure up. It can explode, giving you some momentum or stab ice beam hits really hard. I almost think Regice deserves to be brought back up to OU. I think it's an OU level Pokemon that you see pretty often. It's a very, very solid alternative, especially with the Blissey and Snorlax that has merit over both of them. And if that happens, that might be the first time a Pokemon has fallen to UUBL and then risen back up. That would be funny if that happened. That'll be our first. And now we move on to layer six of the iceberg. And the first entry is Skarm number one. 
A lot of players believe, understandably so, that the best Pokemon in the game is actually not Tyranitar, but it is in fact Skarmory. Skarmory feels like the Pokemon to beat. You need to have a plan against Skarmory in some way. And it's usually not as simple as handling Tyranitar is. Handling Tyranitar is as simple as chucking a check like Swampit or Flygon on your team. And these are Pokemon that aren't just for Tyranitar. It's not like Tyranitar has really specific checks that only answer Tyranitar. Swampit helps you out against Aerodactyl too. Salamence, Metagross, Miscellaneous Physical Threats. It's also a powerful momentum generator in itself with great stab types. Same goes for Flygon. Flygon helps against Aero too. It helps against certain electric types. Skarmory does have one Pokemon that hard counters it, but that is Magneton, who is much more limited in other matchups compared to those Pokemon I just mentioned. Skarmory needs to be more directly and specifically countered with Magneton. And what's crazy is that Skarmory isn't even that terrible against Magneton. Magneton. The thing about playing against Magneton is that if you make a spike, Magneton comes in, they eliminate your Skarmory, you can get a switch in with momentum and you have a spike advantage, so you're not even in a terrible position. Trapping Skarmory with Magneton is a momentum loss. And if you're not running Magneton, which many teams aren't, defeating Skarmory requires a game plan of sometimes multiple Pokemon over a longer period of time. Eliminating Skarmory isn't as simple as just going to a switch in. Skarmory has all these amazing traits like it eludes spikes chip damage toxic all these common ways of making progress skarmory can just dodge all of that it feels invincible sometimes and it gets so so many opportunities to chip heal so many skarmory can take a thunderbolt from zapdos and click toxic and it's pretty likely to chip heal like all the way back up to full health over the course of the game it can come in against an enemy claydol it's totally safe to just sit there and chip heal. it squeezes in protects against the things that come in and threaten it if it goes to if you go to an enemy skarmory you can bring your own skarmory in and just sit there and heal. So the argument that Skarmory is better and more impactful than Tyranitar does have some weight, especially because in recent years, Sandless teams have actually been on the rise and are quite a consistent way to play. More defensive Sandless teams with Pokemon like Skarmory, Claydol, Dugtrio, Melodic, those kinds of defensive cores are very powerful. I would personally disagree with this. I think Tyranitar has more metagame impact and it shapes things around itself more. I am not as fond of those sandless teams as many players are. I think Tyranitar improves consistency massively, but many players do believe Skarmory is number one, and that opinion is growing in popularity. ABR famously uh, made the case for Skarmory number one that actually shifted a lot of people's opinions, and Tyranitar and Skarmory are very close in their metagame impact. They're extremely close. They are the firm number one and number two, and it used to be that Tyranitar was number one by far, but that's not really true anymore. Skarmory is extremely close in power level to Tyranitar, and most people would agree with that these days. Up next, CB Lures. CB is a shorthand for choice band. You're probably a little bit familiar with this concept. I suppose the Houdini set is an example, a choice band set that aims to lure in something specific and eliminate it. But Metagross doesn't really count for this. The choice band Metagross set is very well known and people are conscious of it in battles a lot of the time. This entry of the iceberg refers to the more fringe, crazy choice band lures. One example is choice band Zapdos. Yes, you can run choice band Zapdos with hidden power fighting, which is a physical attack in Gen 3, and that is able to lure in Tyranitar or Blissey. Zapdos versus Tyranitar is a common lead situation and the Tyranitar often just stays in and clicks Rock Slide because it KOs most Zapdos sets, but Zapdos can take advantage of this common situation and totally catch Tyranitar off guard with a surprise choice band boosted hidden power fighting. The other two most common switch-ins to Zapdos are Blissey and Snorlax, so they come in and take a huge super effective hidden power fighting as well, massively chunking them for most of their health, often to hit KOing. Choice band Zapdos also uses Drill Peck, which can punish the grass types that come in, especially Celebi. Another Pokemon that can do the exact same thing is Moltres. Hidden Power Fighting Moltres has exactly the same uh, interactions it can exploit. Tyranitar will stay in against you, you hit them with the big HP fighting, they're gone. They go to Blissey, same deal. In fact, you're even more likely to lure in Blissey with Moltres because Moltres doesn't have Baton Pass. Sometimes Blissey's a bit scared to switch in against Zapdos because of the Baton Pass to Dugtrio thing. 
that I mentioned earlier, but Moltres lures in Blissey more reliably. Blissey's a very safe switching against Moltres, which is something you can target and exploit. Sun and Rain teams can be built around these choice band lures because the Sun and Rain threats with Swift Swim and Chlorophyll benefit greatly from both Tyranitar being eliminated and lured in and Blissey. Blissey walls most weather users, so eliminating it or doing significant chip damage to it is great for the game plan and Tyranitar obviously sets sand on the field, so you want to eliminate it to be able to set your own weather. Another example of a cool choice band lore is Jirachi. Jirachi is also commonly checked by Tyranitar and Blissey, and Jirachi has some cool options on its choice band set. It can run Doom Desire, which is a weird move in Gen 3. Doom Desire will attack the turn after it's used, but it is not a steel type attack. It's actually a typeless physical attack, and it also deals damage based on the Pokemon that was in when it was used. So if you use Doom Desire against a Blissey who has no defense, then they switch to Skarmory. They'll take damage as if a Blissey is taking the damage, so they'll take like heaps of damage randomly. Choice ban laws aren't the most consistent thing in the world, but they can work. They can catch people off guard and enable weird game plans like weather strategies. Up next is the linear curve. What does this mean? This is the name of perhaps the most legendary Gen 3 OU player of all time. The linear curve is famous for being one of the most consistent players in his prime. He was constantly playing on the ladder and he would top ladder to such an extent that he would be about 100 or 200 points above the next person. He had such a dominance and such a consistency that really was unmatched at the time. And his tournament performance was also extremely consistent. He would win so many many events and at worst he would get very high positions. Unlike many of the other top players that still play to this day like McMagan, ABR and HClat, the linear curve is a bit of an enigma. Some people do have contact with him these days but he doesn't really engage with the community as much as everybody else does and he will pop in and out for years at a time. He also has a really unique view of the game and he would build teams in a style that no one can really replicate. Every time someone uses a linear curve team, they never seem to do as well with it as he would. He would commonly build around fringe choices like Machamp or Miltank and do extremely well with them. He has a YouTube channel with some videos that are quite old now, but it's a great insight into how he views the game. He has very in-depth looks at his tournament preparation and what he brought against specific opponents and why. What strikes me the most when watching these videos is how calm he is. He never gets tilted when bad luck happens. He'll just say like, that was unfortunate and then move on instantly. Whereas other players might get a bit emotional or distracted by bad luck. It doesn't seem to affect him at all. And he would often find ways to win in spite of terrible luck and terrible situations. It's a great insight into the mind of a master. This is the kind of attitude you have to have to be as consistent as he was in his prime. Linear Curve is probably my favorite Pokemon player of all time. Something unfortunate also happened pretty recently. I think it was only a couple years ago. He returned after a long hiatus to play in a tournament on Smogon and he was up against HClat. He actually got a lucky freeze against HClat and because of that, he felt that was unfair and he purposely seismic tossed against the Gengar until it thawed out. I think it was something like that. And because of that, he actually got banned from Smogon for throwing on purpose, which is against the rules. And there was a lot of outrage about this because Linear was a beloved player and this was a sportsman-like thing he was doing and he was punished for it. And I can understand this rule being there to combat instances of like match fixing or throwing on purpose to mess with the bracket, but I don't think this was an instance of that at all. And in fact, I think Linear won the set anyway, despite that. So really it just messed up the whole bracket by making HClat progress with a free win when he shouldn't have, and it was a whole thing. I think these things should be analyzed on a case-by-case -case basis, and they were just adhering to a rule for the sake of doing so, even though it actually ended up making the tournament worse. But despite all that, I hope Linear returns someday. We would love to have him back, of course. He enhanced the game greatly and pushed it forward, pushed the metagame forward with his unique ideas, and his impact as a player is still felt today. Up next is Lunatone Sun. Lunatone Sun is an insane team built by the player Super Epic Ampharos that got a miraculous win in Smogon Premier League, the highest level Pokemon team tournament for singles. I covered this in my video, Gen 3 OU's weirdest strategies, and it truly is one of the weirdest things that has ever happened. The reason Lunatone was used on this Sun team is because when you look at the common Sun core of like Executor, Shiftry, Fire types like Houndoom, you'll notice that they kind of suck against Dragon Dance Salamence. They all 
are weak to flying and Houndoom is weak to ground. Lunatone not only solves this problem by being a great switch into Salamence, especially physical sets, because it's immune to ground and it resists flying, it also fits with the special offense game plan of this Sun team because it has access to Carmine and Baton Pass. Access to Hypnosis also helps, allowing you to get a bit of momentum going by sleeping something. Even though Lunatone does solve this specific problem on Sun teams, it is Lunatone. To win with Lunatone in a high level set is insane. I can't stress this enough. This was a monumental moment in my opinion. I couldn't believe it when I saw it. And believe me folks, I have tried this exact team myself on the ladder and my success with it is horrendous. I don't know how Super Epigampharos did so well with this. She's just an incredibly unique player that can win with some unbelievably fringe and maniacal strategy. Up next is Fear X Nine Tails. Fear X Nine Tails is a name that a lot of frequent Gen 3 OU ladder players probably recognize. This is a guy who nobody really knows who he is or has contact with him, but he appears to have been playing Gen 3 OU with the same exact team for over five years at this point. I started playing around 2019 and I've been seeing him on the ladder for years using the exact same team. And this team leads with a nine tails with Hypnosis on it. It also has a slow king with focus punch. I also believe he has a Meganium. It's a ridiculous team. And this guy isn't very good. I'm not, I'm not trying to be rude, but the team is kind of doesn't make any sense. He always seems to hover around the lower ELO ratings, but his persistence is extremely admirable. Just out of curiosity, I checked and he played a game literally today. As I'm recording this, he was playing Gen 3 OU. He never stops and his team never changes. If you type in slash rank Firex Ninetales, this fella has 11,419 games played and he's sitting at a rating of 1,249 at the moment. If you happen to be watching this Firex Ninetales, hello, you're a legend. If you would like to use perhaps a different team, I have some I can send to you. Let's get into contact. Up next is Rain Dance Tyranitar. When I said Tyranitar fits on every team style, I meant it, folks. Not every single team in Gen 3 OU wants Sandstorm, especially teams built around win conditions like Snorlax and Suicune who benefit greatly from Leftovers chip healing if they can get it. In fact, many of these teams will aim to eliminate Tyranitar and clear the weather with something like Sunny Day or Rain Dance purely for that chip healing on their important win conditions. Some teams combine weather clearing with Rain Synergy like Ludicolo teams that have Snorlax or Subsalak Heracross as overlapping synergy. But sometimes in the early game, these teams want Sandstorm and in the late game, they don't. Sandstorm helps you against enemy walls like Blissey and Celebi. So at first you want Sandstorm up to cripple them, but in the late game, you might want to remove Sandstorm. And in these situations, you can actually use Rain Dance Tyranitar, a Tyranitar set that removes its own Sandstorm on purpose. Maybe this is also because you want something like Pursuit Tyranitar to support your Snorlax, but in the late game, you would rather remove the sand. This just goes to show that Tyranitar fits on literally every team, even teams that don't want sand. And the final entry on level 6 of the iceberg is Odengar. This is a Gengar set that uses the combination of Hypnosis to put the enemy to sleep and Focus Punch to take advantage of that sleep. This is particularly effective at punishing Pursuit Tyranitar. Pursuit Tyranitar is one of Gengar's greatest counters, but with the ability to put Tyranitar to sleep and then focus punch it to just KO it outright, this is a bit of an anti-meta Gengar set. This is also very effective against Blissey, who no longer can 1v1 you as effectively. This set is a bit inconsistent though because of the accuracy of Hypnosis only being 60. Hinging on such an inaccurate move, especially when missing could mean you lose your entire Gengar, is quite unreliable. The nickname for the set comes from the play Cyber Odin who uses this set constantly. It's considered good practice in competitive Pokemon to try not to be too predictable and use the same sets all the time. You should mix it up and have some variety in what you bring so that you can't be punished or hard counted. But Cyber Odin is one of those players that doesn't really follow this advice. He always brings this particular Gengar set, or at least very commonly brings it. He also really likes to bring mixed Zapdos and he seems to make it work quite well. He's a very talented player. Sometimes people go a bit too far with trying to be unpredictable and end up bringing team styles they're not as comfortable with, but sometimes a comfort pick that you're 
familiar with, you know all the lines with, can be your best option. Now we move on to layer 7 where things get really crazy. And the first entry is Tail Whip Blissey. Tail Whip is a move you're probably all familiar with. It's what you get on level 1 Rattata and other such low level fellows in the cartridge games. It has the miraculous effect of lowering the enemy's defense by one stage. One of the most unremarkable Pokemon moves ever. And yet there was a set in Callus Invitational where the player Arctic Breeze used Tail Whip on Blissey and confused the entire community. Nobody could figure out what this was for and it didn't appear to do anything in the game. He won the game anyway, but people were all losing their minds over the fact that Blissey was using Tail Whip. It turned out that this was actually a really intelligent tech option. In Gen 3 OU, sometimes sacrificing your entire team and leaving one Pokemon remaining can be a win condition. Because when you only have one Pokemon left, you can't be roared out since there's no other Pokemon to be forced in. Some Pokemon that can take advantage of this include Suicune, Snorlax, and Agility Metagross. And a form of counterplay to this is actually stat dropping moves like Screech or Metal Sound. If the enemy goes for this last Pokemon Suicune or Snorlax win condition, even though you can't roar them out, they also can't switch out and therefore they can't remove stat drops anymore so you can for example screech them a couple of times with your magneton and then bring in any physical attacker and one hit ko them they can't prevent the defense drops and that is why arctic used tail whip blissey on this team tail whip was being used as insurance against a potential last pokemon suicune which otherwise could have beaten arctic breeze as a win condition and it's a bit hard to squeeze that option in on anything else except the blissey on this particular team so even though in this battle it didn't actually do anything except allow Arctic to pass turns by just clicking it for, not, for lack of much better to click. In a team building sense, this was a really smart way to squeeze in one extra out in a bad matchup. And to this day, it's probably the strangest Blissey set that has ever won in a high level game. Up next is Meta number one. There is a case to be made that Metagross is in fact the best Pokemon in Gen 3 OU, and some people do believe this. Metagross does so much in a single slot, it's almost hard to describe. It improves your defensive matchups against many Pokemon that are very important to cover. It generates offense itself, thanks to the absurd power of Meteor Mash, Explosion, and its other physical coverage. It has an incredible amount of moveset variety with mixed sets defensive sets, agility sweeper sets, and the real crux of what makes Metagross so ridiculous is Meteor Mash attack rays. Choice Band Metagross Meteor Mash is often powerful enough to chunk resistances very effectively. Even if it doesn't get the attack raise, it will do like 35 or something to Skarmory. But when it does get the attack raise, your counter to Metagross is no longer a counter. Metagross is now defeating you. You can do something like 50% to Skarmory and to Swamp It. You end up losing so much health on these extremely important Pokemon. And what makes this so powerful is how inherently solid Metagross is even without this high roll situation that can happen. Metagross is already ticking a million boxes for your team and at worst it trades evenly with one enemy. That's the worst case scenario. Most games it trades up because it will KO something and then explode trading with something else. Nothing can withstand Metagross's explosion pretty much except like really defensively invested steel types which are pretty fringe or you know ghost types obviously coming in on a hard read but even then that is so dangerous because if they Meteor Mash you just faint instead. And on top of that that. Even switching into a Meteor Mash Resist can be dangerous because if they get that attack raise, you're getting majorly defeated. Metagross is one of the most consistently high performing Pokemon in the history of the generation and it has been that way since the beginning and that has shown no signs of slowing down. Metagross is powerful enough that it can be a cornerstone of strategies that go in an anti-meta direction and don't need sand or spikes, Metagross can generate enough value on its own to make up for that. I can understand this perspective and I think it's valid. It really depends on what you value in Gen 3 teams and how you view the metagame personally. In my opinion, I would say the top four Pokemon in Gen 3 are Tyranitar, Skarmory, Zapdos, and Metagross in that order. And those four are the s rank Pokemon who are actually pretty close in power level. I personally think it's pretty cool that the top spot is a subjective thing that is still discussed to this day. It's not just automatically Tyranitar. There's a case to be made for a few Pokemon that could claim that top spot. And it used to be believed that there was a huge gap between Tyranitar and anything else. But now Skarmory and Metagross always get their respect as valid contenders and S tier central Pokemon that are on a similar level. Up next is Curse Rest Gengar. This is yet another Arctic Breeze set that was used in Callus Invitational. 
And to my knowledge, this is the first time such a set was ever used in competitive play. In competitive Pokemon, Curse is usually used as a boosting move that raises attack and defense and lowers speed on Pokemon like Snorlax. But if a ghost type uses the move Curse, it will halve its own health and apply a damage over time effect to the enemy, where every turn they will take one quarter of their own health in damage. This is a pretty rarely seen move in competitive play. To sacrifice half of your health for such an effect is usually not considered worthwhile most of the time, which is why this set was kind of shocking for a lot of people. You might be wondering why such a set was even used. Well, this set also used Mean Look, which is a status move that traps the enemy. By trapping the enemy, preventing them from switching and then using Curse, they cannot escape that whopping 25% damage they're taking every turn anymore. If it's a more passive target, you can rest, sit there as they slowly faint. This is a way to trap and eliminate certain targets, but you might be wondering why not use Perish Song for this purpose? Wouldn't Perish Song be strictly better than Curse? It can do the same thing, eliminating them in only three turns. You can simply exit from the field on the final turn. The reason for this is because Perish Song cannot be used alongside Will-O-Wisp on Gengar in Gen 3. It's one of those egg move combination things. Some moves in Pokemon can only be obtained through breeding. And sometimes there's a situation where one move is obtained from one father Pokemon and one from another, and you can't have both of them. This is one of those situations. So Arctic really needed Will-O-Wisp on this team to cripple physical attackers and apply status, give Gengar a bit of value beyond just being a strict trapper Pokemon. So he went with Curse instead of Perish Song, which can do the in terms of trapping targets like Blissey. You can even apply Burn on top of Curse to stack up the residual damage further. And Rest conveniently heals off all the damage you inflict on yourself too. Arctic Breeze is one of my favorite team builders because he finds very creative solutions to problems just like this one. And he always finds these crazy ways to squeeze in a little bit more utility and cover one more matchup in this really weird way. Up next, Suit Tar equals Spin Blocker. So we know that Gengar is a spin blocker and Skarmory can also kind of be a spin blocker in an abstract sense. But who is Suit Tar and how is he a spin blocker? You may be under the false impression that Suit Tar means a Tyranitar wearing a suit. This is a common misconception. Suit Tar is actually a shorthand for Pursuit Tyranitar. Pursuit Tyranitar is a very common set. It is able to trap and eliminate Gengar, and this is a concept you can build teams around. Pursuit Tyranitar is a very common teammate alongside rapid spinners like Foratrus and Claydol because by eliminating Gengar you can safely rapid spin. It's also commonly used alongside fighting types. Ghost types are immune to fighting, but if you eliminate that pesky ghost type on the enemy team, fighting types become a lot stronger. But even in matchups where you're not up against a ghost type, Pursuit Tyranitar can find creative ways to be useful. And one of those is by pressuring rapid spinners. Pursuit Tyranitar tends to invest in full HP and with that bulk it can survive a Starmie Hydro Pump, live solidly, and then KO it back with Crunch. If Starmie would just simply use rapid spin in the face of Pursuit Tyranitar, they would faint. Tyranitar being on the field invites them to Hydro Pump you and it also puts them in a mind game situation because you can also pursuit them if they try to switch out and avoid this interaction. Pursuit Tyranitar also dissuades Foratrus from rapid spinning if it's carrying Fire Blast or Flamethrower, which one hit KO Floritress. And even Claydol struggles to find an opportunity to rapid spin when Pursuit Tyranitar is on the field. You can survive a Claydol Earthquake quite solidly, it'll deal something like 60%, and Crunch will do significant damage to Claydol. So if they rapid spin, they will get to hit KO'd by your Crunch. Therefore, by Pursuit Tyranitar being on the field, they're kind of dissuaded from rapid spinning because it would be so bad for them to do so. Pursuit Tyranitar can even run Counter to improve this matchup against Claydol even further. With Counter, you you can stomach an earthquake and then straight up just one hit KO them with the counter attack damage. So Pursuit Tyranitar not only helps you out against Gengar, it has the added benefit of helping you out in the spike war, even though it is not a literal spin blocker like a ghost type, it improves your matchup against rapid spinners and dissuades them from rapid spinning, because if they do, they're in a lot of trouble. The Pursuit mind game also works in your favor very well. Up next, Miss Drevis OU. 
This is a bit more of a fringe take, but is still one that I see sometimes. Some people believe that Miss Drevis is more deserving of OU status than some currently OU ranked Pokemon like Cloyster and even Gyarados. Miss Drevis has been a fringe choice in the past as an alternative ghost type to Gengar, but it really had a spike in popularity back when ABR experimented with the Pokemon and built the surprisingly powerful Miss Drevis Superman team which ended up really making a splash in the competitive scene. Mistrevis Superman is a team that you would see very commonly in tournaments and other high level situations like High Ladder. Mistrevis is an alternative spin blocker to Gengar. It also has access to Levitate, but the benefit of Mistrevis is that it is purely ghost typing, which does have its benefits. It is not weak to Psychic, meaning that it is very strong against Claydol. Super effective stab Psychic can really punish Gengar and make it difficult to spin block in some situations with Gengar. They can sometimes just snipe you as you come in, predicting the incoming Gengar, or just 1v1 you with more bulky Claydol variants, taking minimal damage damage from Ice Punch depending on their level of investment. Miss Drevis sidesteps this problem with its pure ghost typing, and it's quite bulky in its own right. It has access to Mean Look Perish Song, which can allow it sometimes to eliminate the Clay Doll in front of it if they're foolish enough to stay, or catch some other passive Pokemon coming in and eliminate that, like a Snorlax that might lack Shadow Ball or a Blissey. The set that ABR was using also ran Thunderbolt, because what a lot of players would do to play around Mean Look Perish Song is go to Skarmory and click Raw. By forcing the Pokemon that used Mean Look to switch out, you become no longer trapped once they're forced out. But in order to do this, Skarmory would have to take a big Thunderbolt, and this would result in Mistrevis getting free chip on Skarmory every single time. The Mistrevis, with its powerful neutral typing, can in some situations be more effective than Gengar as a Mean Look trap. There are a lot of teams that rely on Claydol as a rapid spinner and on Skarmory as a phaser. Skarmory, in many situations, is the only Pokemon on a team that has raw and Ms. Drevis is an incredible meta call to punish this team building tendency. More players started to experiment with Miss Drevis in different areas, not just on Superman, but as an alternative ghost on more defensive TSS builds. And Miss Drevis is now viewed as the second best spin blocker and a ghost type in Gen 3 OU behind Gengar. Some people view Miss Drevis in a similar way to Flygon, in the way that Flygon is an alternative to Swampert that is worse most of the time, but has enough distinct advantages to stand out and be useful on different team styles. Miss Drevis has that going for it as well. However, I would disagree that Mistrevis deserves the OU status. The Rise of Mistrevis is an impressive metagame development, a very creative solution to a problem, and a very interesting little thing that has happened. But I do still think it's a bit too specific and niche to quite be OU ranked. You can view it in a similar way to Pokemon like Flygon and Gyarados that are alternatives to other popular Pokemon with a couple of unique traits that allow them to stand out. I don't believe that Mistrevis as an alternative to Gengar is quite as good as those two are alternatives to their respective roles. I also think there's a chance that this is just a fad and the Mistrevis hype will die down a little bit, but I could be wrong. Maybe Mistrevis will only rise in popularity as time goes on. I'm excited to see how the Mistrevis metagame develops. People have already started to adapt to Mistrevis' presence with the rise of sets like Shadow Ball, Clay Doll, and I'm sure there's ways that Mistrevis can adapt back. We'll have to see how that goes. And the final entry on layer 7 of the iceberg is RS200. This stands for Ruby Sapphire 200, and this is a metagame that actually predates the release of not only Pokemon Fire Red and Leaf Green, but Pokemon Emerald. People were playing competitive singles in Gen 3 on Net Battle when only Ruby and Sapphire were released. This is a completely different metagame. A lot of Pokemon that would become staples in the future weren't released yet, and a lot of popular moveset options weren't available yet. Pokemon like Tyranitar, Zapdos, Suicune, Snorlax, Blissey, Celebi, Dugtrio, Aerodactyl, and Gengar were not in the game yet. In current Gen 3 OU, most Pokemon in the game can learn Substitute, and that's because Substitute was a tutor move in Pokemon Emerald. So in Ruby and Sapphire, Substitute was actually an extremely scarce option that not many Pokemon got. Another quirk of this format is that pretty much only Electric types could get Thunder Wave, Sleep Talk did not exist yet, Metagross could not learn Explosion yet, and many future moveset options obtained through means like Breeding, were also not available. Skarmory was extremely dominant in this format. Donphan was much more prevalent as a rapid spinner. 
Without Blissey in the game, Regice was actually the premier special wall, and Grumpig was one of the best counters to Regice. This is crazy. Grumpig is one of the few Pokemon with access to Substitute and Calm Mind, which is a fantastic combination in this metagame. It also had Thick Fat, which neutralized Regice's Ice Beam. Sun strategies were also more effective in this metagame than they are in standard Gen 3 OU because of Tyranitar not existing yet, and a Pokemon like Vileplume could actually do quite well with a sunny day sleep powder and solar beam set. I have never actually played this metagame, I'm not sure if it's still played today, but it is very interesting to look back on this little piece of history and I think it's pretty awesome that even back then before Emerald came out, people were playing competitive singles. This game really does have a long history, folks. Most of the information about this metagame I found in this article by Kiku Chimonji, sorry if I've mispronounced that, and Blue Kirby, who wrote this Smogon article, which I'll link down below if you guys are curious about this metagame. And now we enter the depths, the final layer of the Gen 3 OU iceberg. The first entry, Blissey number one. This may sound crazy, but there is an argument to be made that Blissey is the best Pokemon in Gen 3 OU. This is not a very commonly held belief, but this is something that actually a very prominent and strong player that I respect has made the case for, and that is Arctic Breeze, the same player that I referenced previously on the iceberg. And I believe the reasoning behind his argument is that Blissey is a more essential component on what Arctic believes are the most consistent styles of teams in Gen 3 OU than Skarmory is. The idea is that Skarmory and Blissey tend to go hand in hand. They form that powerful synergistic core, but Running Skarmory without Blissey is way worse than running Blissey without Skarmory. Blissey can be paired with Pokemon like Foratrus or even Spikeless, Stoly builds with Hariyama, Paraspam type things as well. Skarmory teams without Blissey do exist, those more aggressive hyper offense spike teams using Skarmory, but the majority of Skarmory teams do use Blissey. Arctic Breeze is a player that really favors Sandless teams and also more defensive Stoly teams, and those teams pretty much always use Blissey. It is unmatched in its defensive value, longevity, utility, and power in long games. It is the premier special wall in the game by a significant margin, improving your matchup against just about every special attacker there is. And Blissey is a Pokemon that really overcomes all of the counterplay to it quite well in the hands of a skilled player. Even though Blissey is very targetable with strategies like Bulky Dug beat up and mixed attackers, various explosion users, it is still extremely consistent. Even against physical offense strategies who use entirely physical attackers, Blissey remains an important defensive piece and a roadblock against their win conditions. It can stop sweeps against Gyarados, Salamence, Tyranitar, even Aerodactyl. Arctic Breeze believes that the most consistent teams in the game are those defensive teams and Blissey is a requirement on those teams even more than Skarmory is. And that would be the argument for Blissey being the best Pokemon in the game. I do disagree with this and most players probably do, but I do think it's quite thought provoking and interesting. A lot of top players have differing views on what the best styles of play are in Gen 3 OU. A lot of people will exclaim that a Pokemon like Foratrus is terrible and inconsistent, and yet another player will swear by Foratrus, use them consistently, and they can both be right simultaneously. It's a very subjective metagame, there's many ways to view it, many ways to succeed in it, and that's another reason why I love the metagame. Up next we have Gardevoir Hell. Gardevoir can occasionally be used in Gen 3 for some truly heinous strategies. Gardevoir has the ability Trace, which copies the enemy's ability, and one of the best applications of Trace is counter-trapping enemies like Magneton and Dugtrio. Magnet Pull prevents Steel types from switching, so if you trace Magnet Pull, the enemy Magneton can't switch since they themselves are a Steel type. And of course, the same thing happens when you come in against Dugtrio. You trace Arena Trap and now they can't switch out. While Porygon 2 is the more prominent user of Trace in Gen 3, it's very effective at counter trapping Dugtrio and enabling strategies surrounding that. Gardevoir stands out from Porygon 2 because it has access to Substitute and Calm Mind, meaning it can, in some situations, situations, trap the enemy and boost up nearly infinitely if it has the appropriate support. In one team built by the player Pokology, a Torment Skarmory 
is used to bait in Magneton, die on purpose with Skarmory, and then switch in Dug Trio. Since the Magneton is tormented, they cannot use the same move twice in a row, meaning they are completely helpless against this Dug Trio who can substitute, preventing Toxic, dodging whatever hidden power type they have because they can't use it twice, and repeatedly spamming Sand Attack until the enemy Magneton has the lowest accuracy possible. And then after fainting on this Dug Trio, you can bring in Gardevoir, who traps the Magneton yet again. Now they are tormented and have very low accuracy, accuracy so you can just simply substitute and calm mind all the way up to maximum stats and sweep the entire enemy team from there. A similar strategy was actually used by the player Blightbringer in a high level tournament game back in 2018. This team trapped the enemy Magneton with a Porygon 2 who also has Trace. It used Conversion 2 to transform into a ground type, Flash to lower the Magneton's accuracy to the absolute minimum and Rest to stall the Magneton for many turns. Eventually stall most of its PP. And then a Gardevoir comes in, traces Magnet Pool again, substitutes and spams Calm Mind until it can eventually sweep. This Gardevoir even had a Salak Berry, raising its speed above threats like Aerodactyl and Gengar that could maybe stop it. This strategy is an extreme gimmick, and it's all in on this one game plan, making it pretty inconsistent, but in the right matchup, this is a completely free win sometimes, especially if the enemy isn't prepared for it. It is pretty insane what people can come up with in this generation sometimes. Up next in the final layer, GSC is better than ADV. GSC stands for Gold, Silver, Crystal and refers to the Gen 2 OU metagame, and ADV refers to the Gen 3 metagame, named after the Game Boy Advanced. Some high-level singles players believe that Gen 2 OU is in fact the best Smogon metagame of all time and the most balanced competitive experience. They believe Gen 2 OU is a metagame where the better player wins more of the time than in any other metagame. Gen 2 OU is another classic competitive singles format with a long-running history. There is a lot of stigma surrounding this generation. Some believe that it's very slow and stally and solved almost, with Snorlax, Zapdos, Cloyster, and Raikou being absurdly dominant. It can also feel a bit bare bones with mechanics like EVs and various held items, abilities even, not existing yet. Not only do the rest sleep talk mechanics of Gen 2 lend themselves to slower gameplay, offensive mechanics are also not very powerful here. Boosting moves like Dragon Dance and Calm Mind didn't exist yet, and some Pokemon relied on options like Howl and Growth for attack boosts. I personally don't think that slower gameplay is necessarily bad. A very long game of Pokemon requires a lot of patience, and sometimes slower games where both players are inching closer to victory in subtle ways can be quite exciting to watch. I also think that the Gen 2 metagame is surprisingly fast-paced sometimes, with aggressive strategies built around mechanics like Thief and Sleep and Explosion being pretty effective. There is more team variety and moveset variety in Gen 2 despite its limited options, than you would expect. And despite all of my praise for Gen 3 OU on this channel, the metagame does have its problems. When I was talking about Metagross earlier, the Meteor Mash attack raise chance is kind of stupid. Sometimes you can just lose against Metagross and there's very little you could have done about it. Rock Slide flinch chance is another common point of frustration in Gen 3 that can be game deciding in many situations. And the presence of all these trappers like Doug Trio and Magneton and these strategies that hinge on eliminating specific targets can create very matchup heavy gameplay sometimes. Some matchups do feel pretty impossible to win. In Gen 2, there is not as much of that matchup polarity. In most games, both players will be at a fairly equal footing, and the amount of impact that RNG will have on the outcome is quite minimal, actually. I think it's a valid opinion to prefer Gen 2 OU over Gen 3 OU. The reason I disagree with this opinion and believe Gen 3 is the best meta game is because I believe Gen 3 strikes a great balance between everything that I think is important in a Pokemon format and has something appealing for every single kind of player in my opinion. I think players like the Linear Curve and ABR prove that you can have an attitude towards Gen 3 OU that is very risk averse, safe, with a bias towards consistent defensive strategies and 
you can thrive in that mindset. I think that the matchup variants present in Gen 3 OU is often within the player's control in terms of what teams they bring. If you are bringing something targeting a specific matchup or bringing something punished by certain trappers or anti-meta strategies, I think that's on you. I also think that counter teaming is actually an interesting aspect of competitive Pokemon and the fact that it is kind of amplified and it's a valid option in Gen 3 that you can take advantage of makes things interesting as a player and a spectator. I also think that Gen 3 appeals more to players who prefer offensive team styles or anti-meta team styles or fringe options. If you're a meticulous kind of player that wants to mitigate risk as much as possible, there's something for you in Gen 3 OU and you can play like that and have success. But at the same time, if you're an aggressive, flashy player, you can thrive in Gen 3 OU as well. There are tools for you. The presence of Tyranitar and the existence of wall breakers like Breloom and Heracross. Powerful offensive threats like Aerodactyl, Zapdos that can apply pressure to those defensive strategies are very powerful in their own right. If you like experimenting with crazy stuff, digging into the depths of NU and UU and finding niches for weird Pokemon building around interesting things, you can also enjoy Gen 3. Players like Pokology and Super Epic Ampharos prove that to be true. Very respected players that can succeed with really unorthodox out there strategies. And maybe you exist somewhere in between. Sometimes you like bringing some weird stuff and sometimes you like playing by the book. I would describe a player like McMagan in that way, who sometimes experiments with niche stuff, sometimes brings pretty standard stuff. Maybe you're even just a casual player with no interest in competitive tournaments or reaching high ladder at all. I think you can have fun in Gen 3 too, just messing around with random low tier strategies or building some weird idea you thought of. You can cook up whatever you want and I mean that's true in literally every Pokemon metagame but I think in Gen 3 it feels amplified to me. Despite the shortcomings of the generation, despite its flaws, I believe that it legitimately has something for every single kind of player there is. I myself exist somewhere in the middle of that. I sometimes like playing with the meta stuff. I sometimes like experimenting with comedic teams. And in other metagames sometimes I feel skewed in one direction or the other. But in Gen 3 I feel like I can play however I want, whenever I I want. And if you don't like certain interactions that commonly occur in Gen 3 that are the source of very valid frustration, that is fine and there are many Pokemon formats out there that may appeal more to your specific interests. I venture out into other metagames myself when I'm feeling burnt out on Gen 3, but Gen 3 is the one I always come back to. It's like my home. And up next on the bottom layer of the iceberg, slacking equals OU. This is an argument put forth by the player Blues Energy, who famously not only topped the ladder with a slacking team, but broke the world record ELO rating at the time using slacking. I have a dedicated video about this particular story. I have to say that my personal opinion of slacking has also risen recently. Slacking has truant, which is the worst ability in the game. This ability exists as an active detriment to keep slacking balanced. Thanks to truant, slacking cannot act every other turn, but slacking's stats are basically legendary level. It has an excellent base 100 speed, fantastic bulk, and an enormous attack stat. A slacking lead is actually one of the most explosive and effective aggressive openers for physical offense teams. And and Blue's Energy even showed that it can be effective on Spike's teams too. Slacking is very good at beating down Skarmory with chip damage thanks to Focus Punch. It has options for every possible switch hit. It has Earthquake for the Steel types, Focus Punch for a powerful neutral hit against various physical walls, Shadow Ball for ghost types, and Return for a direct powerful stab hit. You can play around Truant by simply switching Slacking out and back in, and every time Slacking hits the field, the enemy is is in a pretty terrible position where a wrong move could mean disaster. Even though slacking is inconsistent thanks to truant and requires predictions to get value out of it, I think slacking is a lot better than it sounds. Slacking can stick around a lot longer than other wall breaker Pokemon like Metacham and Heracross who have pretty limited bulk. It's faster than them, it has a wider array of things it can threaten, and it's also quite effective with wish support as Blue's energy showed. I think maybe the people aren't ready for this one yet, and at the moment I would disagree with Slacking OU because it's not that prominent in tournaments. I think that Blue's energy in particular is very good at using slacking effectively, and I think that this Pokemon could be 
very powerful in the hands of high-level players that prefer an aggressive playstyle. I'm curious to see where the slacking metagame develops. Blue's Energy's team was a very unique take on a slacking team that I think raised a lot of more awareness towards this Pokemon. So I would be curious to see how perception around slacking shifts in the future and whether it actually does rise in public opinion. At the moment, I still think most players view it as a gimmick, but maybe that will change as many things change in this metagame. And the final entry on the Gen 3 OU iceberg is Starless Knights. Starless Knights is a mysterious player, much like the previously mentioned Fear X9 Tales. Starless Knights has also been around pretty much as long as I can remember and has played an absurd amount of games. And Starless Knights has also used pretty much the exact same team for the entire time I have seen him on the ladder. And it is a pretty absurd team. It is a bizarre spikeless offense team with Ludicolo and Lapras. To this day, I'm not really sure what the main game plan of this team is or why this particular combination of Pokemon was chosen. You'll notice that this team is extremely weak to Zapdos with no good special wall. It's also pretty bad against Pokemon like Offensive Starmie and Gengar. But against all odds, Starless Knights with this exact same team for like over five years is a pretty good player. I don't think anybody knows who this guy is, but he has a positive win rate with 6,500 wins and 4,524 losses. That is just an absurd amount of games. At the moment, his ELO is only 1480, but in the past, he has risen up on the ladder significantly. I think I've even seen him at the top five before, which is crazy because everybody knows his exact team. He hasn't changed the team in like six years. To succeed with the same exact team that isn't even that good to begin with for this long is kind of an anomaly. There are these people who have just played the same team for a few years, like Fear X Nine Tails and another player called EV Zero, but Starless Knights is the best of them, and he stands out to me because I'm not sure who he is. I'm not sure how active he is within the community, but he's an interesting figure. Pretty much everyone in the Gen 3 community recognizes his name knows his exact team, and they've all lost to him at least a few times. He's pretty good, he makes good plays, and he uses this weird team very well in a way that almost defies logic. If you happen to be watching this, Starless Knights, just know that we're all aware of your existence and we all respect you begrudgingly. None of us understand your team or why you chose that particular six, but whenever you match against Starless Knights, you have to sit up in your chair like in gamer mode and focus for a sec because otherwise you're going to get defeated. And that concludes the Gen 3 OU iceberg, folks. I have not covered absolutely everything that's ever happened and there are still many quirks and interesting stories and unique players that could be highlighted perhaps in some of my future videos, but I'm quite happy with this as a little rundown of the history of this metagame and everything from common knowledge to obscure trivia. What did you think of the list overall, folks? Did I miss anything that you think is worth talking about, perhaps for future videos? And what would you like me to talk about next? Let me know down below in the comments and thank you for watching.